Here is the ultimate beginner's guide for Affinity Photo, helping you create better photo art and giving you full control over your mid journey and other AI creations. Hello, my friends. How are you doing? My name is Olivio. I'm a professional artist. Let's get started. So on this channel, I have created hundreds of tutorials for Affinity Photo, and this software is actually a competition to Photoshop. It is a lot cheaper. You buy it once. There is no subscription. It is more intuitive to use. It is easier on the resources, but of course it has a little bit less features. But I can guarantee you as a beginner, this will cover everything you need. For all of the fans of the Midjourney AI, I have created a Discord server. The Midjourney AI bot is already joined, so we can talk about the AI ideas, play around with different prompts. I also have rooms for Affinity Photo, Photoshop, Photo Lab, NFTs. So there's a lot of potential to connect and exchange ideas and create together. Also, I want to invite you to my next live stream, which is happening on Sunday. I will create a composite live and we can talk about art, photography and of course, Mid Journey AI. How do you actually open a file in Affinity Photo? You go up here to File and New, and there you have a certain amount of presets. Usually when you work with JPEG, choose the Web tab. You have different kind of screen resolutions in here, although you can always also enter over here a pixel resolution that you need. Here is the color format. This is already set up for you, so it works best with your web browsers and also most devices. So that should be fine. Don't worry about DPI. That is actually not really important for digital files. The only thing that matters is that the pixel resolution is big enough for the print. DPI is just a virtual measurement. So you can go down here and see, for example, higher resolutions as we have it on screens today. When you have chosen whatever you need, click down here on create and this will create your affinity photo file. Now there are, of course, other ways. One that is very easy and fast is, for example, you have your mid journey creation right click on the image, select copy image, then go back to affinity photo and select file new from clipboard. And this will open up that file inside of affinity photo with the same dimensions. I would be a little bit careful about that method. It is very quick, but at the same time, you haven't actually downloaded the file yet. So you don't have a backup in case affinity photo crashes or your computer crashes or something else is happening. So usually I would suggest in your browser, right click on the image, select save image as and then save it in the folder you want to have it and then open it up in Affinity Photo. This is actually next thing we are going to do. We go here to file and then open. You go to the folder where your file is, select the file. You can double click it to open or you can click down here on open. Now, sometimes you don't see the file because some other format like text is selected over here. Simply click on that pop up menu and select all documents. After that, you can open up your file like this and then start to edit it in Affinity Photo. Finally, there is a fourth way to open a file that is going to your folder and simply dragging the image into your open Affinity Photo software. And as you can see, this will open up the file as well. Next, let's talk about layers. What are they and how do you use them? Here on the right side, you have different tabs and one of them says layers. If you don't see a layer tab, go to view and then to studio. And there you have the different kind of tabs you can have. Search for the layer tab and make a hook next to that and your layer tab will pop up. Now, the way to think about layers is in the sense of glass sheets that are lying on top of each other and you are looking from the top down through them. So when I put another layer, for example, here rectangle on top of this, you can see that now the rectangle layer is on top of my image. 
If I drag this below the image, the layer is still there, but now I can't see it because it is behind the image. Unless, of course, I would move my image out of the way. And then as you can see, there is that layer again. Let's give it a different color. You can see, I can see that again. So this is the basic way how layers work. Now, of course, there are different kinds of layers and some of the most useful layers in Affinity Photo are called adjustment layers. As the name says, they offer you a lot of different kinds of adjustment. Now, you can see down here is an icon, which is a circle that is white and black. Click on that. This gives you a pop-up menu and there you have a lot of different adjustments in there. Open them up play around with them, see what they do. They are non-destructive. I will explain to you later in the video what non-destructive actually means. But for example, we can have here a curve adjustment layer and this can make the image brighter or darker, give it more contrast or even less contrast. So you can play around with that. There's also color adjustments and all kinds of other layers in here. For example, here we have color balance. You can see you can readjust how that image looks in Affinity Photo really quickly, creating variations or adapting it to your taste. A very important concept you need to understand in Affinity Photo about image layers is there are two different kinds of image layers. One says in the brackets image, the other one says pixel. Now the image layer has the original image in the original resolution and you can move this around. You can resize this any way you want and this will still keep the original resolution as it had when you imported that file. But the caveat here is that you cannot really adjust this layer in any way. You cannot paint on it. You can't erase anything from it. You can't copy parts out of that. To make that possible, you need to rasterize that layer and then it will become a pixel layer as it says here in brackets, pixel. Now to rasterize a layer, there's two different ways. Right click on that layer and select rasterize and this will turn it into a pixel layer and it will have the resolution you have set for that image at that time. That means if you make the image really small and then rasterize it, it will have a really small resolution afterwards. But what you can also see is the whole image is still here. Now, when I use the second method, which is right click rasterize and trim. What this will do is it rasterizes it exactly to that size and also the resolution that you have for your affinity photo file. But at the same time, it will crop it also to that size. So when I move this around, you can see everything else is gone now and the image is ending at the borders of my affinity photo document. So this is a very important distinction between the two and both have their ups and downs. Next, we're coming to live filter layers. Now in Affinity Photo, we do have normal filters as we find in other software, but they are destructive and they will be applied directly to your pixel layer. In contrast to that, when we go down here and we have this kind of hourglass shape, you have a selection of filters not all of them, but a lot of them that you can use. For example, we can go here to blur and you can see I can apply blur to the image, but at the same time, this is non-destructive. So that means I can always go back, turn it on and off. And also I have a mask inside of that. So I can paint that on certain areas of the image only. So have a look at these different filters that you find in here, play around to see what they do. Next, there are mask layers. Now, one thing I already pointed out is when you have adjustment layers or when you have live filter layers, they have a built in mask. You can see this by opening up, for example, the color balance. Let's move this slider over here. So everything turns from the color. Let's see like that, for example. And you can see this has a white rectangle in here. So there's a mask and this means you can use your brush, the normal paintbrush, 
And then when you use black as a color, this will hide the effect as you can see. So I can remove this from the face if I want to. And when you use white as a color, this will add the effect as you can see here. So of course you can also use gray values and then only reduce it partially. So with that you can have a nice map over your image depending on how strong you want the effect to be applied. On top of that we also have masks in Affinity Photo that are independent from the layer. They are mask layers. So when you have this shape down here which is a rectangle with a dark dot in the middle and you click on that, this will create a mask layer. Now when I use this, let's use this again with black and a brush, you can see that this part of the image now gets hidden. And this again is non-destructive. I can turn this on and off. The original image is still there. I would highly suggest that you use this method rather than copying parts or cutting parts out of the image because that way you can always adjust the shape later on or go back to the original image if you need to. Next, let's talk about the difference between clipping layers and child layers. So for that, I will make that image here smaller so we can see the effect better. And I'm going to create a rectangle here on top of that image. Now, when you look over here and I drag my layer onto that image, I get a long blue line or a short blue line and they have different effects. If I have a long blue line that means that now that green layer is inside of that image. You can see that it stops at the border of that image because I have now made this a child layer of that image layer. But if I have this as a short line now this acts as a clipping mask. So you can see when I move the rectangle around the image is ending at the edges of that layer. So this of course can be very helpful when you want to create different kinds of selections or want to use these images in different ways for example like that. And again this is non-destructive you can always go back to the original. Next, there are also text layers. Now when you go over here to the text tool, you can either click and this will create a text layer, but usually what I do is click and drag and this will give you a preview of that font and will show you the size. So by dragging this, you can adjust the size you want to have and then write in that size. So that is a lot easier and faster. After you've written the text, you can go up here and adjust the font color to anything you want. Of course, you can also move that font around and you can give it a different font over here if you want to. Also with these handles on the side, you can resize that, you can also rotate that and you can also when you go here over these middle points here, you can also skew that to the side like this or like that. So there's a lot of ability to adjust text. Keep in mind when you're using text and you want to send your affinity file to another person, they also need to have that font file. If you have downloaded a font from the internet, send them that font file too. Let's talk about destructive versus non-destructive for a moment. When I have my image layer here, I take my brush and I paint on that image. This is in the same layer and this is destructive because it has changed the pixels in the image. You can see I cannot individually move that green brush around. And I can also not remove that green color from the face anymore. This is why it's called destructive. This also applies to the filters up here or anything you do that changes these pixel layers directly. Now in contrast to that, I can click down here to create a new pixel layer and I can then paint on that pixel layer. As you can see, this is an individual layer. I can move that around. I can rotate that and resize that afterwards, no problem. So this is a non-destructive method to paint on that picture. And I would really suggest as much as you can use non-destructive methods inside of Affinity Photo. Let's talk about blend modes. So here I have a grunge image 
and this can be mixed with my image below. The way you would do that is you select that layer, go here to your blend modes and there's a lot of them. So play around with them, see what they are doing and then you can apply them to the image. And again, they are non-destructive. Now here is an easy way to understand some of the categories and that is you see that they have white lines here. So those are similar. And in this case, you can see when you have something where you want to add the dark parts of the image, use these blend modes that are in the dark area. So you can see when I use darken, only the dark effects of my grunge layer are applied. But when I use the areas over here for the light colors, you can see that the light parts are applied while the dark parts are hidden. So this is an easy way to use that. Then below that we have different styles of overlay techniques. So you can play around with that too. You can see you can create really artistic things with that. And below that, there are some more complex, but also very creative ways to use blend modes. So as a beginner, play around with these up here, the first three categories, and then go to the more advanced blend modes later on. I've also created a video about layer blend modes that covers the first categories you have just seen. Here are the best tools to adjust and fix images in Affinity Photo. One of the best one is the Impaint Brush tool. Select that and this will remove things from your image. Now again, I want to suggest to you to work non-destructive. So don't work directly with the pixel layer. Instead, go down here and create a new pixel layer. But now for the tool to work, you need to go up here where it says current layer and select current layer and below. With that, you can zoom into your image. Here's a trick, hold the control button and then use your mouse wheel to zoom in and out of the image. Also to resize your brush, you can use control and alt, then click and hold your mouse button, move left and right. This will resize the brush, go up and down. This will make the brush harder and softer. So with that, I can adjust it to the size of the thing I want to remove, click on that. And you can see with one click, this has been removed. I can do the same thing down here, make the brush a little bit smaller, brush on that and you can see it has been removed over here, boom, and it's gone, very easy. But at the same time, I have this on an individual layer so I can always go back and readjust and fix that. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind if you have these extra layers, if you make adjustments afterwards, for example, with a curve, if the curve is in between the original image and that fixed layer, this curve will only be applied to the layers below it. So when you make the image darker, the other parts will stay bright. So this means you have to have your adjustment on top of both of these layers so they are adjusted at the same time. The next tool to fix parts of your image is the clone brush tool. Select that again, create a pixel layer for that. Go up here to current layer and say current layers and below or layers beneath. Now, after you've done this, the same thing applies. You can go in here, adjust the size and softness of your brush, but this time it's a little bit different. First, you hold the alt key and you get this little cross here, select a source and then go to the area you want to fix and you can paint on that. You can see like that, it has removed that part, but this has more benefits. For example, if I want to have this as a source here, but then I want to have this as a rotation, you can use your arrow keys to rotate that source. So I can, for example, apply this over here and put it, for example, in this location like that. When you've used it like this, it's really important that you reset the rotation up here to zero. Another thing that you can do is that you source a location, but then up here, turn off alignment of the source. So that means no matter where I go and start to paint, this will always start from that specific spot. And this will give me a very quick way, for example, to paint something in to my image. 
Next, we have our patch tool. This is hidden under the in-paint brush. So you see every tool here that has this little white triangle has tools below them. Click and hold and then select the patch tool. Again, you want to create a pixel layer. You want to select current layers and below. And this time the way it works is that you circle the area you want to fix and then you can move your mouse around to select another area that you want to have as the source for fixing that patch. Click and then click again and this has fixed that area. Next we have something called the warp tool. It is found down here. There's two tools in here. One is the mesh warp tool, the other the perspective tool. So in this case we want to select the mesh warp tool and you can see we have lines here on the outside but I can zoom into the image. I can double click here and this will create these little anchor points. I can click over here. It will create another anchor point for me and you can do this as often as you want. So when I for example click again in here and in here I have now more lines and now I can for example move this inwards to adjust my image like that and you can see that the outside will stay put. So this acts also like a protection for that area. Now of course you can see when you do this the pixels get stretched and if you do it too much this gets rather pixelated. So be a bit careful using that tool. Let's click on apply here and this is our result where we have adjusted this area a little bit. But you have to be careful with that and usually only do it a tiny bit. And often when you use this tool, it is also very useful to rather copy this part to a new layer so you don't get that pixel stretching in the first place. So for example, let's select this eye area here. Control C to copy, Control V like Venus to paste it in there, Control D to deselect. Now I have the eye on an extra layer. Now when I go to my mesh warp tool you can see it only is about that area. I can still click in here if I want to or just use these handles and you can see now I can bend the face around but the rest of the pixels in here they stay put. So you can adjust this eye for example in that way. I'm not doing something that's useful here. I'm just showing you how to use this. Now when I click apply you can see there is less tearing of the pixels. So next we create another pixel layer on top of that. Use our in-paint brush tool, set it to current layers and below and then simply go over these areas to try to fix them so the eye blends with the background nicely. And you can see like that we've adjusted the eye without much pixel tearing in the image. Another way to bend pixels in Affinity Photo is the Liquify Persona. Click on that. You see a mesh. You can turn that mesh off so you see only the picture. And then you have over here the brush size, the hardness, opacity and speed. And on the left side you have different methods to bend your pixels. So with this for example we have the push forward tool. I can go in here and I can for example push the nose more inward if I want to have or in another direction. So you can see you can lightly, this is important, use it lightly not to extreme because otherwise you get pixel tearing again. You can move the pixels around to fix them in a way you like. And you also up here have a slider to reconstruct the mesh so you can go back to the original or you can go more extreme with what you have done. But you can see in this case if I go more extreme I have some pixel tearing down here, over here and there. If you like your result go up here to apply. If you don't like it go to cancel. The liquify persona is a destructive method. So if you want to use that I would always suggest to right click on your image layer and select duplicate so you use the liquify tool on a copy of that image rather than on the original image. Here is how to adjust the size of your image. First of all you can go to document resize document and this will change the resolution of your image. You can make it smaller, you can also make it bigger and you can also use math in here. For example I can say here I want to have this times which is the 
little star icon and then two and you can see this will make it times two but I can also go in here type slash and then two this will divide it by two so now I have half of it then you click on resize and this will recalculate the size now when you make this bigger for example times four this will give it more pixel but this is not an AI upscaling tool so it's only having more pixels it's called super resolution where you have a certain anti-aliasing effect on the edges but it does not have more details it will not look sharper because of that another thing you can do is go up here to document and resize the canvas now the difference between the canvas and the document is if you use a resize document it resizes the canvas and everything in it if you use resize canvas it only resizes the canvas so for example if I use in here times two and then I click on resize you can see that the canvas now is actually four times bigger which of course is it is two times bigger in the width and two times bigger in the height but also you can see the image is still the same size because we only change the canvas but not the content of the canvas another way to resize your image is of course cropping in affinity photo we have a specific crop tool for that it has different modes right now it is in the mode unconstrained which means you can use these handles to make them any size any kind of ratio any kind of part of the image but you also have other modes like original ratio which you can resize but it will keep that original ratio you have also custom ratio you can enter the ratio up here that you want to have and you also have the mode resample when you use that and you crop the image it will have the same resolution afterwards so this actually will basically upsample it to a higher resolution but as I said this will not give it more detail it just as you can see here has the same pixel resolution as the original head another benefit of the crop tool is when you click on the cockwheel over here there is different presets in here for example for different ratios if you want to use it for Instagram for example one by one is good also four by three is a good choice now if you want to rotate this to have three by four there's a rotate button up here now it's three by four and you can just put this anywhere you want or you can resize this any way you want another thing you can do with the crop tool is that you can hold control click and drag and you can see we get a ruler in here this is for straightening the images so you can see when I go up here afterwards it's going to rotate it so this is a horizontal line afterwards if you don't want to crop simply click on cancel if you want to crop click on apply there's one more way to change the size of the image that is going to file export and here in the dialog for JPEG PNG GIF and other formats you have the size and you can change the size in here without having to change the document or canvas size beforehand so this makes it a bit easier to export it in different sizes without having to change your affinity photo file now let's talk about how to save or export that image when you save it it will be saved as an affinity photo file with all the layers we have two options in here one is safe and the other one is save as the difference is when you first have saved that file and you use save again it will save it in the same file when you choose save as it will save it into a new file this is very helpful when you want to create versions or backups so for example when you want to try out different things make a copy of the file so you have your different versions separated into different files for exporting you go to file and down here export and here you have different file types usually for the internet you would use JPEG or you would use PNG 
In both cases, you can select the size of that file. You can make it bigger if you want to. It will do a little bit of upscaling, but it's not AI upscaling. It's just making the image bigger. You can also make it smaller in here for the export. For example, if you want to send it in an email or use it on your website, a smaller size often is useful. Then you have presets for quality. I would usually always go with high quality, which will set it to 85. And then the whole area of the document is usually preferable. You see here an estimate of the file size and you simply click here on export. Another thing is PNG, which gives you an uncompressed file. You can see it is much bigger. This is also why you don't have a choice here for the compression, but you can still set the size of the image. A benefit of PNG is that if you have transparency in the background, this will also be transparent in the PNG file, which is good if you want to use it, for example, for web design. The other image files here are more advanced. For example, PDF is good if you want to print the image, but in that case, you would to have to edit it in CMYK, which is a bit more tricky and advanced. And GIF or GIF is something you can also export as in Affinity Photo, but it does not create animated GIFs, so you cannot do that in Affinity Photo. It's just a GIF. You can also see here that you can export PSD files for Photoshop. This kind of works, but also kind of not because Affinity Photo and Photoshop have different tools, different filters, different adjustments. So don't expect this to work 100% in Photoshop. And also if you have a Photoshop file that you get from someone else, don't expect it to open up in Affinity Photo and have 100% the same look and all the easy effects on there because some of the functionality is missing in Affinity Photo. One more thing that you can do in Affinity Photo is that you save the file as a template. For this, you go here to export as template. What this will do is that it saves it in an Affinity Photo type file, but the file ending now is .af template. You can use this to save it into a folder of your choice. And then afterwards, when you go to the file new dialog, you have templates over here and you can add that folder so that you have your custom templates. So if you create a lot of files that are using the same ratio, the same font, the same setup, these kind of master files will make your work a lot easier. Now let's talk about the shortcomings of Affinity Photo because of course for that price it can't do everything. One thing I don't like in Affinity Photo is the developer persona. This is meant for raw development but it is very bare bones and the way it works is not very precise. So I would suggest for that to use other software like DxO Photo Lab or Lightroom to adjust your raw photos before you bring them for artistic work into Affinity Photo. Another thing I don't like in Affinity Photo is the macro recorder. You can do it in a very basic way, in a complex way that also doesn't really allow you to adjust the recording afterwards. So it works a little bit, but not really. This also has, of course, implications for batch processing because the macro recording is so complex and limited, creating batches from the macro is kind of limited too. Affinity Photo doesn't really have native art boards, which means that you would have multiple areas in here with different ratios that you can adjust at the same time. However, I will link a file below that video that has art boards in there and that you can use in Affinity Photo to create as many art boards as you want and in any ratio you desire. And as I have already pointed out, using Photoshop files in Affinity Photo is a bit limited and also kind of dangerous because if you save over that Photoshop file, it might destroy the effects of the original file and that not work as you expect in Photoshop. Here are some tools you want to check out as companions for Affinity Photo. 
One tool I want to highly suggest to you when you're using Mid Journey a lot is Gigapixel AI. This is an upscaling software. It's a little bit pricey, but it uses AI to not only add more pixel resolution to your image, but also give nice crisp details to your artwork. And this especially works good with the styles that Mid Journey is creating. So you can see here, this is the before. It's very pixelated, doesn't have much detail. This is the after with a four times upscale, nice soft edges and a lot of details in here. And one of the biggest benefits I see with this is that Mid Journey is changing the details of the image when max upscaling, but Gigapixel AI is keeping the details the same, but making them richer and giving you more resolution at the same time even much higher resolution than Mid Journey can provide at the moment. Personally, I often use DxO PhotoLab for my raw development. It is fantastic, very easy to use, very intuitive, but maybe a bit pricey. Then we have Nick Collection, a collection also by DxO that has very, very beautiful plugins that create analog looking photo effects for classic cameras, classic film types in color in black and white. It also has a beautiful black in for perspective adjustment for sharpening for printing and also sharpening for web use and the plugin called Viveza, which is very amazing for adjusting light and contrast. So you can basically relight the scene in a very beautiful way. Also, I want to suggest to you Adobe Lightroom Classic, which is extremely powerful, very fast, very intuitive. And when you have to adjust a lot of photos, like hundreds of them, Lightroom is a very good and quick choice. If you want to save some money, look at Luminar AI, which is similar than Lightroom, but it has some AI features and can create beautiful popping images that are especially good for Instagram and other social media sites. Also, it has AI that will help you improve the look of a face, apply digital makeup, replace a sky and use new ambient light for the scene. And finally, if you are into digital painting, I really want to suggest Krita to you, which is a very capable and also free software for digital painting and digital art. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and check out my other videos. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and see you soon. Bye.